Hi everyone. Um, I'm, I hope that everyone's uh, healthy and doing well despite the situation that we are in. And uh, thank you for taking time to attend our online meetup. We are uh, fortunate that we can leverage technology to fill in the voids left by or caused by the current pandemic. So, yeah. Again, uh, I would also like to thank uh, ReactJS Philippines for giving me the opportunity to to do this talk. I think this will be the first time I'm, I'm, I'm doing a talk for ReactJS Philippines despite being part of the group uh, since the since the beginning so yeah let me start i guess so again uh, i am rem lampa and this talk will be about improving react testing developer experience using current open source tools so if some of you are not familiar with the term developer experience, it's an often overlooked uh, aspect of software development in which uh, the experience of a developer is measured uh, with regards to the workflows, the tools, and the processes involved in shipping applications and products so the less friction that a developer has in terms of getting his work done of course the the, the faster and uh, <clears throat> the more features that uh, the whole team can uh, can create and uh, bring out into the world so this is a really important uh, important thing that should be considered by by developer companies, software development companies. But oftentimes, uh, this is <clears throat> this is not given much importance, or worse, they don't even know that this concept exists. So, I hope through this talk, uh, we could bring more awareness about stuff like this, developer experience. <clears throat> so before we proceed, I would like you to try to run this. Uh, repository on your local so let me give you a few seconds to screenshot this the the most important part here is that you should check out this branch this uh, repository was supposed to be part of my talk before that was supposed to be uh, conducted prior to the lockdown but of course the lockdown happened and uh, well here we are so much of the code here is outdated I updated it last night uh, and the updated code is in this branch at OS testing tools so try running this on your local A little bit about me, I'm a self-taught uh, web, web development engineer and specifically focused right now with uh, React.js but I do dabble in uh, backend, uh, mostly in JavaScript, Node, uh, MongoDB, and Python. I also work with Python and Django. I'm actually a 
a career shifter. I was for almost a decade a registered electrical engineer. And this one is uh, not not too many people know this, but I actually authored a very simple Chrome extension uh, that uh, helps the user control the speed of Facebook videos. Because I myself, uh, whenever I watch videos on YouTube and uh, Facebook, I tend to to uh, increase the speed of the videos to 1.5 to 2 to two times the the normal speed because I, I, I value my I value the time that I spend uh, watching these videos. Uh, if I could uh, watch a video twice the speed and I still understand it. Uh, I, to me, that's maximizing my time. So yeah, uh, two years ago, that uh, there wasn't any product that uh, solved my problem for Facebook because it doesn't have speed control. So I added that, released it into the wild, and in the spirit of open source, I released it as an open source project. It's available on GitHub and Currently, last I checked, actually we can check right now. It has already 5,000 plus users, which is, which is very surprising because I created this for myself actually. Uh, since I've released it, I've, I haven't uh, created updates. So the, the source code is, oh, Source code is uh, available on GitHub, on my uh, GitHub profile. Uh, if you're any one of you is interested in picking that up and, you know, adding features, converting it into React, because it's currently written in Manila JavaScript, just go ahead and create a PR. I'm also just this is just recent, recently. I've uh, I've adopted a plant-based life lifestyle due to the due to what's happening to our environment uh, with climate change and all that stuff, uh, and especially now uh, that uh, there's a pandemic that's caused by eating animals. Uh, yeah, this is one of my uh, current advocacies that uh, everyone should at least adopt even partially a plant-based lifestyle. It's healthy for you and for the environment and for the animals. So there's, there's nothing to lose actually. Um, yeah, and it's a great way to, to reduce your carbon footprint. It's actually the one of the best ways to reduce your carbon footprint. And lastly, I'm a street street photography uh, hobbyist. Although uh, recently I haven't been able to go out and shoot in the streets, but it's really a passion of mine. I shoot in film, uh, black and white film, and yes, uh, film photography is still very much alive. Uh, in terms of professional uh, work, I do, I am currently a senior, senior developer for Prospo. If you're not f familiar with Prospo, we are a company that creates uh, career placement platforms for Newly grads, it's an Australian uh, company that originally catered to Australian and New Zealand uh, market, but now has expanded to Southeast Asia, and is planning to expand even more into Europe 
and in the United States. So one of our high profile clients here in the Philippines is Far Eastern University, which incidentally is among my alma maters. Quick trivia, I, I have stud, studied in quite a number of universities and uh, schools, so uh, I know the difference of in cultures between uh, campuses. And yeah, um, as you could see here, I'm also one of the co-founders of Harvest Dash and it's a startup that's still currently in heavy development and we plan on providing solutions for uh, our agricultural space so hope i'm hoping uh, we are hoping that we could launch maybe late this year or uh, early next year and uh, yeah so during my free time, uh, weekends and evenings, I'm really busy, bu busy uh, working on this. Yeah. And my previous employers include, again, uh, as an electrical engineer for almost a decade in Meralco. And my web development career started with top shipment, which I did uh, as a part-time developer while working at Meralco. Then I finally jumped, jumped ship over to Piggy. This is an American startup uh, based in, in Ortigas. And just recently, about last year, I was part of, no, I mean this year, Early this year, I was part of NoStack before I transferred into Prosmo. I am also quite um, active in the developer communities, namely in ReactJS Philippines, which I am in which I am a board member, and I am also one of the founders and community managers of Free Code Camp Manila. If you're not familiar with Free Code Camp Manila, it's a community of self-learners or uh, aspiring aspiring uh, IT professionals. Uh, and we help people learn how to code using freecodecamp.org. And we, yeah, as can be seen in this picture, we hold uh, roundtable meetups which we, in which we help uh, each other learn more about computer science and uh, other concepts regarding the IT industry. So feel free to join us. It's a very positive community, much like ReactJS Philippines. So what should you expect in this uh, talk? First, our goal is to, for you to gain awareness or familiarity with several open source tools related to automated testing, <laughs> namely Jest, React testing library, li library, mock service worker, and uh, Faker JS. And uh, hopefully along the way you could pick up pick up a few uh, techniques in how to do unit and in integration testing, especially mocking APIs. And uh, especially for beginners. Uh, since this is a very short talk and we have a lot to cover, you probably won't understand everything today. And that's very much okay. That's to be expected. 
what you should get um, what sh- what you should aim for uh, other than mastery is is familiarity and awareness so that you know you could whatever you uh, what whatever little knowledge that you could you could acquire from the stock you could build on it in your own time so let's try to discuss what what sort of software testing really is at least for my uh, understanding I will try to laymanize this because uh, when I was first starting out uh, learning this it's it's a lot of abstract concepts so I don't want to burden you with that uh, so let's try to simplify it so we have here a a, uh, <clears throat> a diagram a white box representing the piece of code or software that you want to test so what makes up what makes a piece of code actually work so for a piece of code or a software or application to actually work you have to provide it with uh, data right and that data we will call input and from that input when the, the your application will process that input so that it could produce produce data for consumption of any of your users and and that data that uh, the software produces we will call output <clears throat> excuse me and sometimes most of the time especially in uh, uh, poorly in poorly uh, architected software sometimes it could cause side effects that's side effects are uh, data or behavior that your piece of code or your software uh, is causing which may, may might not be or may or may not be intended or even uh, you or you may not be aware so in general side effects are are, uh, are to be uh, avoided um, examples of side effects are it's hard to think of uh, of an example right now but if someone can think of a side effect maybe uh, they could post in the comments or the on the chat on, on uh, chat on the chat okay so let's discuss this later but this is a uh, javascript equality operator the triple equals um i'm I expect you to guys to under, uh, to be aware of this. So this piece of code or software can be anything, and and can can vary in scope. It can be just a function, or a method, or it can be a, a whole object, or a, maybe a huge module or a whole system. A large system itself so our input so we will now go into the uh, uh, <coughs> into the concepts of of software testing so in software testing our input is something that we can we can we can control so we will call them our knobs or control variables these can be function arguments or keyboard input mouse input webcam microphone whatever you know whatever you can feed into your application or the code that you are testing our output is our observed variables what does it mean um our observed variables are uh, data that we observe 
uh, whenever we change our input. Uh, yeah. So whenever we change our our the, the, the data that we input into our software, we expect or observe what comes out of the of the uh, of the particular software and uh, from these uh, output we we compare them with our expectations we assert some some level of or yeah we we assert some level of um of uh, consistency between the input or I mean between the uh, actual output of our software and our expectations. So uh, that's what uh, the equality, side, uh, equality operator is doing here. We actually compare the two values, whatever the output. Oop. So again, I promised that I would try to laymanize this. Pardon me if I uh, drink a lot of water because I haven't done this in a long time <coughs> and my throat is drying. <coughs> so let's compare this in uh, say algebra. Say we have an equation x plus y equals z. So x plus y uh, the, pl the, the, the plus operator is actually, uh, humor me, okay, is our, is, is our, uh, the addition operator is our piece of code. And X and Y are our input variables. And Z, on the right hand, uh, on the right side of our equ equation is our output variable. So what this means is, X and Y we can control, and Z is our variable that we observe. What does it mean? Say um, we assign uh, an, uh, a couple of numbers to X and Y, because you know we can control the, the values of X and Y, so we can assign any number. Say we assign 1 to X and 2 to Y. So x equals y and y equals 2. Whoops, what was that? Sorry. Where did that come from? Huh. Anyway, um, where was I? So, yeah. So we can assign any values to our input variables. So for x, we assign, uh, for this is instance, we assign 1 to x and 2 to y. And since we know that our uh, application should be adding the two, uh, the two inputs, we have an expectation of what the sum would be. So our expectation is 1 plus 2 is 3. So we are expecting that the software would return us the, num the, the value 3. So when we run the, the uh, addition through the plus operator, we, we, uh, the output, which is the Z variable, assumes the number 3. So that's the actual output. So when Z equals 3, and our expectation is, of course, 3. We find that 3 equals 3. So we can say that our uh, test has passed. But if for some reason, uh, we, again, we, we, we use the same values for x and y, 1 and 2. For some reason, that the uh, z becomes some uh, any 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 value other than three say two and two the actual output of our equation 
or of our form formula is not equal to our expectation, which is, if you remember, our expectation is 3. So 2 and 3 is not equal. So the actual output is not equal to our expectation. So we can say that um, our test has failed. So I hope that's clear and I won't uh, uh, delve more into this or dive more into this because uh, I have limited time. But that's the gist of software testing. So why do, why should we uh, write automated tests? First, it uh, serves as living documentation. Which means that if you've seen, uh, if you've already seen uh, written, or if you if you've already uh, written, or if you've already read uh, automated tests, you could see that there are uh, strings or descriptions for each test, and they describe what each test. Uh, uh, or what is the what is the expectation for the software that it is testing? So those descriptions serve as actually serve as documentation. So for our uh, previous example, the x plus y equals z equation, we could say that we have an expectation that the equation should be adding x and y, and that it should be storing the the output value to z so that behavior is embedded into our tests and if for along the along the way or in the future that uh, our expectations or business requirements change so our our uh, equation would change and the of course our expectations would change and we have to we have to change also our tests so that uh, it would reflect our desired behavior, uh, our desired behavior, or expected behavior for our for our equation. Or in terms of software development, our uh, desired behavior for the piece of software being tested. So whenever any change in business requirements happen, they should be reflected in our tests. And consequently, uh, our descriptions, if any, or if uh, if required, would have to change also. So it's it's uh, it's that's it's what makes the uh, automated tests uh, living. Is in that in that whenever there's a change in requirements for our software. Our, uh, our tests change along with it. <clears throat> so, in addition, that's why I, I uh, instead of thinking as testing as, you know, testing, in which you have pass or fail, I like to think of automated testing as specifications in which we specify our desired behavior or we embed where we embed the business requirements into our tests so that we could specify how a piece of software should be behaving. If it passes, it means that our current at at, at the current state the software being tested is behaving according to our expectations and requirements. If it, if, it's, if it fails, it means either one of two things. One, of course there's a but. But more importantly, it means that our software is not behaving according to what we need it or what, what we expected it to behave. Or maybe our specifications embedded in our tests is outdated. So maybe we have to update 
our uh, our tests to rewrite them so it's actually a, a reflection of the business requirements or uh, and expectations uh, it's um, it transcends you know the term test it, yeah it, tra it it transcends the term test and uh, it's actually a a, uh, a specification of what we want our software to behave well, how our software is supposed to be, be to be behaving so you know uh, if you're a developer of course most of you are developers uh, don't don't take it personally if your code is or your yeah if your code is failing tests it just means that maybe uh, business business uh, requirements have changed or there is something that you introduced that caused the the whole system to change its behavior okay so <clears throat> Another uh, reason to do automated testing is to ensure integ integrity of software in which uh, it, it instills a sense of confidence with every change, with every commit, and every push, and every deploy to production, and with every refactor. So since we have a set of specific specifications on how your software is supposed to behave, Whenever you introduce a change, you are you are instilled with uh, some sense of confidence that uh, you get feedback whenever there's something that you introduce that uh, that uh, that's uh, that that cost or that's causing or that can cause your software to behave in a way. That's not intended. So without tests, you don't have any sort of feedback uh, that tells you that, hey, you added this line, and because of this line, uh, the software is now behaving behaving differently. And uh, it's deviating for, from what you expect it to be. So yeah and of course i mentioned here refactoring it's very hard to refactor without if you if, if you have if, if you if uh, your software doesn't have any sort of tests so it's really a good it's really good practice to have uh even a small layer of testing so that it could make your uh, refactoring efforts a lot easier there's a lot of a lot of times that I've, uh, that uh, tests has have saved my ass, <laughs> uh, in which I ha I've had to rewrite a whole uh, a whole module or a whole component or uh, a large piece of software, and without tests I wouldn't have been able to re to do the rewrite because I don't have any any sort of feedback. So there are a few types of React testing. These types aren't, aren't uh, exclusive to React, but uh, from what I see, these are the most uh, commonly used testing technique techniques in React. One is the the most basic one is snapshot, in which. Uh, <clears throat> in which um, the return of your uh, component our or the, ren the rendering of your component is uh, serialized into strings and saved into snapshot files so that in succeeding test runs uh, our test runner would uh, would take those files and compare them with the output of, of your components just direct comparison there's not much logic in the 
in these uh, tests just uh, just simply simply converts or serializes any output of your components or uh, functions into strings if you look, take a look at the uh, snapshot files that's that's what they are just strings and uh, it uses the strings to compare uh, the values of your components in succeeding runs <laughs> unit tests are the most common uh, type of tests tests in which in which um, tests are more uh, concerned with uh, testing small pieces of software which we call a unit and it tests it in isolation from other uh, parts of your of your software so this is the more, com more, more common practice but uh, as you would see as this uh, in, in the stock uh, the the trend now is to move away from unit testing <clears throat> and to go into integration tests integration tests meanwhile are uh, are tests that that integration tests are tests that test uh, a larger piece of software or uh, let's say for unit tests it tests um, individual components while integration tests <clears throat> uh, is more concerned about testing the interaction of these components with each, with, with each other so unit unit tests are uh, are concerned with testing components in, individually but integration tests would uh, for say for example it would test widgets which compose of multiple components so it tests components as a group not individually end to end tests are actually just integration tests but uh, larger in scope and uh, as the name implies it tests the whole uh, the, the whole uh, uh, flow from user interaction to to database uh, uh, saving to yeah the whole system actually from user to to your servers it tests that whole flow generally end-to-end uh, uh, -end tests are uh, rather slow because they usually use uh, actual servers for them to run as opposed to integration tests that you can mock out some of the some of the servers and apis end-to-end -end tests uh, can actually be run in production in production applications <clears throat> Visual regression tests are, are similar to snapshot tests, but they actually test the visual visual uh, UI of your application, in which the most of them um, create screenshots of your applications at uh, at, at every uh, interaction using uh, during testing. So the difference in the, is in the scope of each test. So from snapshot, which uh, just test uh, the output, unit tests um, test uh, individual components, integration widgets, and to end test your whole your whole application, and visual regression tests concerned more about the actual visual UI. So yeah, <clears throat> allow me to introduce you to the testing library. 
It is uh it was authored by Kent Dodds and from the description on their website, it is a simple and complete testing utilities uh, testing library is a set of si simple and complete testing libraries that encourage good testing practices. It has support for uh, multiple front-end libraries and front-end frameworks and libraries, including React, Vue, and uh, React, Vue, and uh, Angular. I think even for Svelte. If you are familiar with Enzyme, the testing library completely uh, replaces it and it actually has a smaller API than Enzyme and it is geared towards uh, integration tests although you can also use it for unit tests and uh, even end-to-end -end tests so the uh, primary objective of testing library is to mimic real-world user interaction as opposed to something like Enzyme which tests implementation details. Another, uh, another tool that we will be working with in this talk is Mock Service Worker. So Mock Service Worker is, or for short, MSW is an uh, API mocking library for browser and node. Its uh, primary objective is to intercept uh, at the network level. So whenever you, whenever your tests uh, request something from the API that you're testing, uh, mock service worker would intercept that uh, request and uh, depending on how you implement it <coughs> excuse me mock service work uh, you you, uh, you can control mock service worker to return uh, responses according to how you want your test to behave so this is uh, different from application level interception which uh, which is uh, um i guess uh, being used by something like apollo client in which uh, apollo <laughs> apollo client provides a apollo uh, a mock apollo provider which you can use in your tests but in my uh, experience the, it's very hard to work with and very verbose and uh you know Mock service worker and uh, React testing library, when used together, uh, can help you write fewer tests and uh, less less effort, but larger uh, testing coverage, as opposed to you know something like Apollo provider, Enzyme, and uh, similar tools that uh, force you to write so many tests. And uh, don't and some of some of those tests don't even provide actual or real uh, value to to your uh, to your testing suite. And I'm sure if many are familiar with this uh, library, Faker JS. It is a library that helps you generate massive amounts of fake data in the browser in in the browser and in uh, Node.js environment it is a javascript implementation of similarly named fake data generation libraries for different programming languages so there are other uh, libraries out there uh, named faker but uh, uh, written written for other languages like uh, python ruby java i think the, it has also a faker library so Faker.js is for, of course, JavaScript. So again, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I guess we could uh, dive in on the code. Wow, 45 minutes. Ah. 
I tried to l lower it to 30 minutes, but uh, I guess that's not happening. Ah, here. So I have here a uh, simple application. Um, it's already running on my browser, I think. Yeah. So here, uh, it's a, a search engine that uses the uh, API of GitHub. So whenever we initiate a search here, there. So it fetches, uh, <clears throat> it fetches uh, repositories according to your search term. And you can sort it uh, according to stars, forks, and uh, ascending and descending. So for React, <laughs> I'm surprised about this. Uh, <clears throat> The number one repository for React is actually FreeCodeCamp, and React itself is, uh, oops, React itself is just second in terms of stars. <laughs> but for best match, of course, it would, uh, yeah, it would return the uh, official React library. In addition. Uh, we are also fetching dummy data from a GraphQL uh, GraphQL API. I'm using this API, GraphQL zero. So we're fetching ID one and getting the username and email and displaying it here. So this is the uh, username and this is his uh, email. So yeah, that's the, uh, the application. Excuse me. Let me just back back off one step. So I have here, yeah. Let's do this hard. So now we are. So yeah, let's uh, do a quick, quick uh, run through on the actual code. So we have here our search form. This is the uh, component responsible for uh, for uh, the whole application. So uh, here in this line, I'm uh, upon render, I'm fetching uh, the aforementioned user data from the GraphQL or the fake GraphQL API. So this is the user query. If you're not familiar with uh, GraphQL, that's totally fine. And uh, if I highly suggest that you learn GraphQL because it's going to make your life a lot easier. So what we have here is, yeah, we're providing the uh, ID, then using that ID to query the fake API to get the username and the email. So I'm also using here a couple of uh, relatively new libraries for GraphQL. It's use SWR and uh, GraphQL request. These two. <clears throat> Instead of Apollo, which is uh, very hard to uh, to to set up for uh, for a simple application. <clears throat> I am also using here uh, for another uh, new 
open source library you uh, uh, this is react hook form this one and previously I was I used uh, formic but uh, I'm enjoying using react hook form because of its uh, much simpler than API So I have here too a uh, callback, which this callback is responsible for uh, doing this search. So whenever we click this button, we are calling this uh, callback. And that callback is using Axios to fetch from this uh, API from GitHub. So we're providing the uh, API with uh, the query term our sort uh, sort qualificator <laughs> uh, but just some uh, some variables that uh, the API uh, requires then of course we set uh, a loading indicator Or a loading state to our application whenever we we fetch those repos. Then after fetching, we assign that to the to the uh, repos uh, state variable, just this. <clears throat> so here on the render, so this is responsible for rendering the uh, user data that we fetch from the graphql api so when there's no data it signifies that it's still in loading state so we instead return a fetching user uh, uh, text but if the data is available we we just render the whole uh, username and email of the user Then in our uh, our form, again we provide the fetch repos uh, callback here. Okay, I'll render the form, and <clears throat> upon hitting submit, we saw earlier that we set the is submitting state variable whenever we call the callback. So if the is submitting variable is true, which signifies that uh, it's, it's currently loading or fetching the data, we return fetching repost text. Otherwise, we return search text. Then here, it's uh, straightforward. We, upon fetching the repo, re repository data, we map over them and uh, display the data in a very decent manner. Oops. So that's what's happening here. Again, let's refresh. See that in action. Fetching user, you saw that. Then it uh, immediately changes into the actual data. Then the button text changes to fetching repos. Then we, uh, <clears throat> upon fetching the data, we display the data. So that's the uh, gist of the application. I'm not going to, I'm not even going to attempt to do live coding because that will be that will eat a lot of our time so instead I've already written our tests beforehand <coughs> use me <coughs> so this is our our test it's called it's co-located in our uh, search form search form folder 
So I should have named this search form spec.js, but uh, yeah. So this test file, uh, this test file imports uh, our search form so that we could uh, run tests for the component. Immediately, we we'll, uh, we 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 see here a faker. <clears throat> so faker uh, helps us create random values for our for our data. <clears throat> so instead of uh, I I know I don't know if you've uh, heard of the saying that there are two time, uh, two things. That's hard in computer science. One is naming variables, and one is invalidating uh, cache. I've learned this from my boss. <laughs> um, so instead of having to try to, you know, try to generate uh, fake data for our tests, we instead uh, assign that job to Faker. So we have here uh, faker generate random data that mimic the response of the GitHub API. So this is the uh, data structure of uh, GitHub. We're trying to mimic it and we're using faker to generate the data. If you notice here, I'm using faker.seed, uh, which uh, helps you, helps um, create a more uh, uh, what do you call this consistent set of uh, randomly generated data. So at, at each run, <coughs> whatever uh, uh, whatever value this. Uh, random faker call generates uh, it would stay consistent at each uh, test run so they, there won't be any any unexpected changes which is very very crucial in uh, automated testing we need to we need to ensure that any of our input variables uh, stay consistent from from each from each test run to to test run. So yeah, oh we're generating the ID name, the owner avatar. Yeah. Then in uh, in automated testing, there's a, a concept we call mocking, in which we in which we uh, uh, substitute our own implementation of a library or a function instead of using the actual library for example uh, Axios if we use the actual library in our tests every time we run our tests it will it will uh, it will uh, cause a request or generate a request to uh, the GitHub repository or GitHub API, I mean. <clears throat> and we don't want that, especially if we're using our actual servers and we run our tests. Uh, we don't want our tests to be tests to be heating our uh, our actual API so what we do is we hijack the fetching library uh, in this case Axios we hijack it and replace it with our own implementation and that process of hijacking the uh, the library is called mocking fortunately uh, in in jest we can do that automatically in which we add add the 
a, a declare a file inside the mux folder as you see here src uh, mux with uh, surrounded by i forgot what they call this double underscore and uh, if you put a uh, a file there and it's named after a uh, module in your node modules folder it will use this instead of the uh, actual library so let's take a look at the, we take a look at the contents of this library or of, of this mock mock uh, mock file So uh, again, just uh, provides us with with, uh, with automated uh, tools that help uh, lower lower the work that needs to be done to be done to create our tests. So here we are uh, using gen gen gener generate mock for mo module function and what this does is uh, it tells just that whenever it, it uh, encounters an import to axios it instead returns a mock module so this file just exports that mock module now that now that it's being exported by this file Whenever we uh, import Axios, we're actually importing the Mac, the Mac uh, implementation. So this is not the actual Axios li library anymore. Why do we need to do that? Again, we go back to the discussion of input variables. So by mocking a library, we turn it into something that can generate input variables for our uh, for our component or for our function that we are currently testing so it allows us to have that remote control or uh, a remote knob to control the inputs into our function so in this case it allows us to control axios or any call to axios So here, in this, uh, in these three lines, what I did here is that whenever Axios that get is called, it should return uh, or it should resolve uh, with this value, which is an object with a property of data, and that data is another object that returns the items array. So here, during our test run, just will see that we call the axios that get. So whatever uh, we uh, whatever the uh, code is placing inside the uh, arguments, uh, it will the, the the mock function will capture that, but. Because we told the mock function that it should resolve with this uh, data, that data variable will be, will be populated with our items array. Yeah, still following? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, what mocking is doing. It allows us to have that uh, control over the library so that it could become another input variable into our uh, tests <clears throat> so right here uh i will not discuss the uh, syntax of jest yeah, it's available in their uh, in their documentation but I am following the IP uh, convention in which, uh, uh, for example, in this line, 
I usually do this, it should have a header title. Again, uh, we go back to what I was discussing uh, earlier that it's living documentation. So let's see that test run. Oops, why is there uh, a failing? Let me restart this. Okay. Here. So this is, uh, uh, as I've said, this is uh, a living documentation of how your component should behave. The search component should have a header title, should render a search form, should execute a GET request when form is submitted. So it's very helpful, especially to uh, people who aren't familiar to the uh, code base, to understand how uh, the current uh, piece of code should be working just by uh, declaring this uh, set of para uh, set of requirements or set of behaviors in uh, your tests. Very useful. So that's what this is. It helps you document your whole uh, your whole component and its behavior. So inside this, we uh, we have a set of assertions, assertions or ex expectations, which is uh, denoted by the expect uh, function. Here, uh, since we described here that it should have a header title, we have here uh, a an expectation that says we expect the header element to be in the document and here we expect the uh, text content of the header uh, header element to be uh, this text it's a uh, it's like just tell, telling a story right so that's the basic uh, basic structure of jest and uh, usual uh, most uh, javascript test runners they usually follow this convention so now um, we will uh, study or uh, take a look at how which we would render our components in our tests so I, I'm here, uh, I'm using here the render function that's being provided by the React testing library. <clears throat> so in this uh, test file, I am importing both render and wait for, wait for functions so yeah render uh, helps us render the uh, the component on our test run so for this particular uh, test uh, we are rendering just one component search form and from there the render function returns a set of uh, utility functions uh, in this case i'm just you i'm I, i'm just using get by text and get by text uh, what get by text uh, does is it uh, whatever you prov whatever text you provide it or whatever string you provide it or even reg regular expression you provide it it will try to find that uh, that text inside the generated render com rendered component. Let's try to uh, inspect what this is. So let's console log this.
Yeah. So this is the output of the get by text. So it actually gets a uh, a reference to the the <coughs> HTML element that contains that directly contains the uh, text that you were searching. So we have here an H HTML heading ele element. And the text content, I think, is... Where is it? Here. You see that? That's uh, the GitHub repository search text. So similar to jQuery or uh, vanilla JavaScript, where you can select particular elements in the DOM. This is similar to that, but in the context of uh, in the context of a test run, you don't actually have the browser DOM, but it simulates it or emulates it. So we have uh, selected the. Uh, Using only the text that we uh, that we provided, uh, get by text. It retrieves for it, it it retrieved for us the DOM element that contains that particular text. So this header element is actually a DOM element that's returned by get by text, and as as, as we saw earlier, that it's uh, it's an actual header element this one and uh, of course we just wanted to ensure that it is actually in the current DOM document <coughs> HTML document then yeah this is just plain uh, HTML an HTML uh, property text content and we just uh, assert, uh, asserted that or uh, asserted asserted the expectation that uh, <coughs> the text should be github repository search which as we can see here <coughs> is just that we can try to fill that by doing this and uh, since we changed uh, the uh, the text inside the heading element you could see here that hey we have feedback that the <coughs> the component changed its behavior or its output so we are, we were expecting we declared here that we are we were expecting that we should be receiving github repository search but we got github repos repository searches which uh, depending on the situation which could be what we want or in this case it is not what we want so return it <clears throat> then um, already one hour <laughs> um, yeah then the next test we have is tests for uh it tests that whenever we submit the form, it should it should initiate the GET request. If you're currently using uh, tools like Enzyme and uh, Mocha and other such uh, tools, please do take note of the differences. I will not discuss uh, the differences anymore because I'm running out of time. Um, yeah, so we have here a test that uh, describes that 
the get request should be should be initiated whenever the form is submitted. So I have here another set of tools that I'm extracting from the render. And one, this is useful for uh, getting uh, <coughs> getting references of uh, input fields. Get by label text. So our form has, for example, this input field has a label of keywords. So I use that label to get a reference to that input. <clears throat> so here, um, I get a reference from that keyword and uh, I use another library from testing library, user event. And I use that to type uh, a value, another random generated value from Faker. And I, uh, I uh, force the test run to type that value into the input field. Similarly, I do that for, uh, for the dropdowns in which I select uh, values using user event. Then, um, <clears throat> Since uh, form interaction in, re in the real world is asynchronous, it doesn't happen uh, synchronously, we would need to await uh, for a behavior before we uh, interact uh, with, the, with, the form, with the form further. So this is what wait for uh, we, we, this is what the uh, testing library wait for function is for it allows us to uh, await uh, for something to to pass before we proceed with the with the test so in this instance uh, so in this is instance uh, whenever we submit <coughs> the form, the submit button becomes disabled, as we see here. It's disabled whenever is submitting is true, or uh, there's no there's no value for the query uh, input field. So. What we are asserting here is we expect that the uh, search button uh, selected by get by text, the closest button to that uh, text should not have an attribute disabled, which means that since since uh, the query field this query field is already populated with uh, with values using user event uh, the search button should not be disabled anymore and when that happens when this expectation uh, returns true Uh, we can already interact with the search button because we can already click it since it isn't uh, disabled anymore. <clears throat> so we select that button using get by text. Then we click on it. Then on clicking again, it's another. Uh, it is another asynchronous operation. We are already fetching the data from the repository. So we expect our search, uh, search button to return or to have a text of fetching repos. And, we, and, when, it, and when this uh, happens, this will uh, 
resolve to be true. So we can proceed with our uh, other expectations that after this resolves to be true, or after the uh, after fetching the repositories, the text but uh, the bottom text would revert to search, and we will uh, assert that actions.get has been called at least or uh, actions.get function or method has been called uh, only one time that's the assertion here and we also expect that actions was called with these uh, argument this is the assertion so <clears throat> upon clicking we expect that uh, the search button changes its uh, text then reverts back after the data is returned then we expect that actions has been called with this uh, argument so it's a little uh, from when, when I was starting out this was a little uh, hard to comprehend but uh, just uh, just try to be you know try to Familiar, familiarize yourself with the uh, with the concepts. So that's the whole uh, test run for this. And with that kind of behavior, we are we we are already testing uh, the whole flow of form submission. <clears throat> So for people uh, using Enzyme, as you can see, we could we are not uh, concerned with selecting selecting DOM elements via or components via class names or uh, the types of components components being used or any HTML element. We are more concerned uh, in in how. We are concerned with how the user actually sees uh, your application because as a, as a user I have no idea what class class name was used for this I have no idea uh, I, don't, I, I, I have no idea that h2 was used for this or what kind of component was used to generate this as a user I, I'm already I'm, I'm, on, I'm only seeing text so testing library is more concerned about selecting text and uh, what uh, selecting whatever the user actually sees in the real world so for example uh, the selector for get by text the selector for uh, for uh, selecting this uh, heading we used the text github and we we, we we already got the html element for the header same for these uh, for the form <clears throat> similarly we uh, we do that here in which uh, I go through our list and uh, invoke that initially there's no data being rendered here and when the where is it yeah when the search button is clicked Initially, uh, the, uh, the, the the data is uh, or the list is empty, but eventually it will uh, generate uh, a uh, repository list. So that's what I'm doing here. 
there's a lot of uh, assertions, as expectations here. But I won't get into much detail anymore because they are similar to previous tests. And uh, this one, yeah, this one tests each each uh, each uh, repository element. So this the, that test would test each repository element and uh, assert that when uh, this is clicked, it would uh, redi redirect to the uh, corresponding GitHub repository page, which I'm doing here. Where is that? I actually do a click here on the uh, repo card and. Uh, I uh, assert that the lo window location uh, is changed to the HTML URL or the URL of the repository. I hope that's uh, that's uh, understandable or uh, clear. Yeah, the, the, these are very similar uh, concepts that I've already discussed. This one. Yeah, and clicking and selecting the uh, drop downs. It's uh, actually a rep repetitive, repetitive process. And here I tried a manual mock of our window object because the window object is not is not available on the Node.js uh, environment. So we have to create our own window window object with the location with the location parameter. Actually, there's an, an easier way to to test links, but uh, I just wanted to show here how how you would go about that if you wanted to. But an easier way is to just check the. Uh, the href property of the link so you, you don't actually have to click the link you just have to check the uh, the href property that it matches the your expectations so that's that for uh, the testing library again testing library helps you uh, it replaces enzyme uh, enzyme is more concerned about uh, selecting different uh, elements on the on the render DOM by their classes or the actual actual uh, HTML element or component, but uh, testing library uh, doesn't do that. It, uh, actually, there's no way to do that unless you use another. Uh, is a, a, a explicit uh, what do you call this uh, property data I think that's data test ID I don't know if I'm using it here no I'm not no so to actually select a an element using the DOM or DOM selector, you would have to use data test ID and uh, testing library forces you to use that as a last resort. It is more concerned about text. Let's check the uh, <clears throat> documentation. So here's the API for testing library. Yeah, this is for querying. It only has just a few. Get by, get all by, and you combine that with these queries. Get by title. Alt text is usually for 
selecting images role for buttons this one is uh, last resort test by test id yeah so compared to enzyme this is just uh, a much uh, slimmer slimmer api than enzyme enzyme has lots of selectors the api for react for uh yeah for react is actually very small you only have yeah render cleanup and act so for the talk we'll, we are only using render cleanup you can automate this with a uh, jest that's all discussed in here so we move on to our uh Another way to mock API uh, requests. So what we, what we did uh, earlier was to mock out Axios, which is well and good. But what if we want to change our uh, fetching library? You know, what if we just wanted to use use ES6 fetch? So if we do that, we would have to change our our mocking, right? And that's quite a hassle to do. Although just as we as, as we already saw, just uh, handles much of the mocking work for us. But there are a better way of testing things. By the way, eight two four. Uh, I don't know if uh, rem this reminds you of anything. <laughs> um, yeah. Where was I? So if you if you notice, I I haven't tested the GraphQL uh, bit yet, but uh, we will do so right now. But uh, let me just uh, take a break and go back in a little while where is it 